Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hacking History. Code Red was a computer worm that spread out of control back in 2001. It caused widespread outages of web servers, cost billions in repairs, and set the world into panic. But what did this worm do, and how did it spread so fast? Who were the hackers behind it, and were we actually lucky to be attacked? This is a Jason Sick video. On Friday the 13th of July, 2001, perhaps even more scary than a horror movie, web servers all over the world would start to get infected, one by one, spreading rapidly, endlessly finding new hosts to infect. For the first few hours of the infection, there would be no symptoms. However, after the worm had already spread, it would effectively take down the website of the server it affected, defacing it with a message saying that it was hacked by Chinese. A few days later, the worm would carry out a distributed denial of service attack, otherwise known as DDoS, against the IP address belonging to the White House. The goal was to overload the web server and cause it to crash. On the day the worm broke out, a systems administrator detected strange and abnormal activity on their web server and checked the logs to discover thousands of requests, all coming from different IP addresses and all looking for a .ida file. We'll go into this more a little bit later. The sysadmin brought this to the attention of two security researchers at EI, a cybersecurity company at the time. The researchers performed extensive analysis on the worm and named it Code Red, based off the caffeinated soft drink they were drinking at the time. But by the time the researchers could properly understand the full nature of what was going on, the worm had already affected thousands. Numbers vary from source to source, but the initial uptake of the worm appeared to be slow. But by the 18th of July, a week later, there would be over 100,000 infections. This will then be doubled by the end of the next day and reach a total of 360,000 by the 20th of July. By this date, it appeared that all vulnerable hosts were infected, and this was estimated to be about 16% of all Microsoft IIS web servers on the internet, which was about 1% of all web servers worldwide, with rough estimates to be about 300,000 of the approximate 30 million websites online at the time. Keep in mind, these numbers are only rough predictions as it's hard to know exactly how many websites were online back in 2001. Fortunately, most web servers were running Apache on Linux and were not affected by this vulnerability. By the end of August, the National Infrastructure Protection Center, or NIPC, a former branch of the FBI, estimated that a total number of 661,000 unique IP addresses were infected. So what exactly is a worm, and what did it do? A worm is a piece of malware that has the ability to self-replicate and spread. Often they'll include some type of malicious activity. But in many ways, this worm was rather juvenile and didn't cause a great amount of damage, especially compared to some more recent attacks such as the 2017 WannaCrypt. However, as mentioned earlier, the attack had a very specific target, and that was a web server running Microsoft IIS version 5. This attack was not actually targeted at personally owned computers, and instead was meant to attack servers that hosted websites. There were a few cases where personal computers would be infected, and this would be machines running either Windows NT or Windows 2000, which had Microsoft IIS enabled. Once the machine was infected, it appeared that the worm had three primary goals, which were all timed. Firstly, this was to hijack and deface a website of a victim host to read the following. Welcome to worm.com, hacked by Chinese. This was accomplished without even touching any web pages on the server hard drive, but instead infected files that were in system memory, which were used to run IIS. These are also known as DLL files. This would remain as long as the host is infected. Secondly, it would replicate itself and spread as much as possible by randomly generating 99 IP addresses in attempts to find new vulnerable hosts to affect. Therefore, many websites that were running the Apache web server host on Linux had records of the worms attacking the server, but were unsuccessful. This would happen between the 1st to the 19th of the month. Thirdly, the worm would launch a distributed denial of service attack against the IP address belonging to whitehouse.gov. This would happen between the 20th and 27th of the month. 
though it was discovered that attacking the IP address instead of the domain name would be a bit of an oversight by the developer of the worm, as a web server was just given a new IP address, and this would repeat the same cycle every month with the 29th, 30th and 31st, the worm would be asleep. This might be the part of the video where it gets a little bit technical, but bear with me as I'll be breaking it down as simply as possible. Earlier on, I mentioned a .ida file. Well, it just so happened a month earlier, Microsoft announced a vulnerability with these .ida files and gave it the vulnerability code of MS-01033. And this was published on the 18th of June, 2001, a full month before the events of the code red worm took place. A security patch was released on the same day and system administrators were encouraged to update their servers with this hotfix. This vulnerability is susceptible to what's known as a buffer overflow attack. This is a very low level exploit, but I'll try to explain it as simply as possible. This attack occurs when an attacker crams a lot of junk into a variable, which is like a container for data. This is done until the variable is overflowing and we can escape out of it. Then, we can replace an address which tells the computer what code to run with an address of our own code, which we include in the attack, effectively tricking the computer. When you can do this remotely on other computers, this gives attackers almost full control over the victim computer without physical access. What you're now seeing on the screen is the exact exploit that Code Red used. The vulnerability was within the URL parameter of an IS version 5 server. Attackers found that calling the default.ida file followed by a question mark and 223 junk characters would allow them to escape and specify a new memory address where they could run the worm from. So what were the impacts of this worm? Well, Computer Economics, a Californian-based internet research organization, estimated that the worm has already cost 2.4 billion US dollars in economic impact. This included 1 billion to cleanse, inspect, patch and return systems to normal service, and 1.4 billion US dollars for other support functions related to lost productivity due to the worm. Adjusting this for inflation, this is about 4.04 billion US dollars in 2020. According to founder of vmiss.com, Rob Rosenberger said, quote, I'll make a simple prediction. Email servers will clog up on Monday and Tuesday with warnings about this horrifying worm, end quote. Rosenberger has a point here. The spam in the mailbox could further decrease productivity with mailboxes filling up, especially with their minimal size at the time. Due to the nature of the code red worm, a new wave of infections was expected to start on the 1st of August. As a result, some servers, including the US Air Force, were intentionally pulled offline as a precaution, especially as it was suspected that the next wave of infections would have been more devastating than the first. Rosenberger was quite vocal in response to this and said, quote, Unbridled fear about code red made many USAF bases go offline via precautionary disconnect. I repeat, fear crippled the Air Force, not the worm itself, end quote. And this is the part where media played into the hysteria a little bit. Unless a new worm was to spread, the goal of the worm from the 1st of August would have been exactly the same, to spread and replicate while defacing websites and dosing the White House. But if your server had the related security hotfix installed, there would be nothing to fear and would be immune from future attacks. So this is the area where, despite all the chaos of the worm spreading at the time, system administrators were really, really lucky. A machine that was infected with the code red worm could be quarantined by simply restarting the machine. That's it. That's literally all it took. The worm would be removed from the server, but the server would remain vulnerable to future attacks. The reason why a restart would clean the worm is that the worm lived purely within system memory and at no point did it migrate to the hard drive to attain persistence. To protect the server against this attack in the future, especially from the 1st of August, the server would require a system administrator to download and install the security patch for MS-01-033, followed by rebooting the server. 
While it's expected that the patch size was small, some people had issues being able to download the file and patch their services. As a result, Microsoft made an announcement that they would improve the delivery of future updates. Nowadays, hackers are attention seekers and like to get credit for their attacks. But in this case, the people behind Code Red is a little bit of a mystery. China was quick to come under the spotlight, partially because of the message in the defaced websites, as well as the FBI claiming that they tracked the origin of the attack to China. The FBI would then issue a warning against the University of Foshan, located within the Guangdong province of China. Professor Fan of the computer department at Foshan University said, translation, In my opinion, it is very unlikely because I've only seen headlines on Bo Yun Ruba. I don't see others that have reported similar headlines of this type of speculation. In addition, I think the source of these headlines are not verified, as it is not from a reliable source. The reporters who mention these headlines do not refer to any reliable sources, such as the Xinhua News Agency. And translation. The teacher here was clearly denying the attack. But, despite the denials, many still believed the attack originated here. However, not everybody agreed that it was China. Some people interpreted the message on the DeFace website to be a red herring, and that it would have been performed by another nation or hacker. EI, the original researchers behind the worm believed that it originated in Makati City in the Philippines, the same origin as the I Love You attack the previous year. Personally, I find it pointless to point the finger now, but with everything we know about the worm now, we can reasonably assume that the developer of the worm could be anywhere within the world. All it takes is for one vulnerable server anywhere in the world to become infected, and that would become patient zero. It would spread from there. Despite all of the impacts, could this worm be the wake-up call that the internet community and system administrators needed? Computer scientist Vern Paxson from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory seems to think so. Quote, The internet was lucky this time, as this particular Code Red program squandered its advantage and left itself vulnerable to security measures. That will not always be the case. This could have been so much worse. End quote. As system admins were able to fix this worm with a simple patch and restart without any lingering damage, I think Vern Paxton is right. This time we got off really lucky. But not all cyber attacks ended up this way, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell as I'll be doing more in-depth analysis videos like this in the future. So do you remember your servers or websites you visited being affected by Code Red? Be sure to share your experiences in the comments below, I'd really love to hear about them. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave it a like, and if you really want to show your support, you can share this video, it really helps me out. Anyway, this has been Jason from JasonSec, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Jason Security, cybersecurity for everybody.